not easy to live in this fallen world, but we're not alone into that. And we are continuing in Leviticus. It is part six. Um, so some of you are here for the first time. You, you, you don't know what we've been talking about, but it's a section six. Last time we had a good video uh, that illustrate the major themes of the of the book, the sections, uh, some of the major doctrines, and it was with a lot of good uh, explanation. We know that all the sacrifices, the system of the Leviticus priesthood, the system, the the priesthood itself, it all have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. These were the the shadows, types of announcing, preparing our understanding. To that when Jesus Christ would come and he would be the high priest, he is the high priest, he has become, and he is still our high priest, and he's praying and interceding for us, and he is sacrificed. Last time we talked about the, the day of expiation, remember? And we talked about how that on that special day, it reminds us of the work of Jesus Christ being the sacrifice for our sins and also the removal of our sins forever. So we want to continue today in Leviticus chapter 18. It's quite a strong chapter. You might be shocked by the content of this chapter, but God puts it there and it is important, especially in the time as the time in which we live right now. It is important for us to, to know what God has to say through this chapter. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 2 to 5. Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. I am the Lord your God. Can you say that with me this morning? I am the Lord your God. This is so important. So, because I am the Lord your God, do not act like the people in Egypt, and you must not imitate the way of life, that they, the country where you will go in. You must obey my regulation, be careful to obey my decrees, for together I am the Lord your God. If you obey my decrees and my regulation, you will find life. You will have a more abundant life, a better life. You will, you will enjoy life. That, that's what basically God is telling us. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. And uh, chapter 19, verse 26, that is the theme of the book. You must be holy because I am the Lord your God. Because I, the Lord, I am holy. And I have set you apart from all other people to be my very own. I have set you apart means I have sanctified you. I have consecrated you. I have made you holy. So holy means separate for the purpose of God. So this picture gives us also an understanding of the, of the background. They went in Egypt. They were 70 people. They stayed in Egypt for 430 years. They become more than a million, maybe two millions, three millions. They were a lot of people when they came out. But they have lived without God, uh, without synagogue, without temple, without priest. This had not yet been established. They had been living for 430 years. Think about it. Uh, this is very important. Under the Egyptian lifestyle. That's all they have known. They have grown up, generation after generation of children, they have grown up knowing that society, their way of life, uh, the, the, the rules of the land and the government and the, the law and everything. It came from the Egyptian. So God led them out of Egypt. And we know, all of you, if you have been a Christian long enough, you know that Egypt and the Bible is a symbol of the, the world uh, for us a New Testament Christian. So they have been taken out of a worldly system. They have been brought at Mount Sinai. And there God started to tell them something. The book of Exodus, Moses received the pattern of the, the tabernacle. They built a tabernacle. And the last verse of the last chapter of the tabernacle of, of Exodus, the glory of God came in the temple. But it could not come in yet. 
and then Leviticus, God had to instruct them first. So that is very important that we understand that because that is where they have learned, they had to learn that God loves them. You know that? They didn't know God. They are brought over here. They have to learn about God. Who is God? What God does want of them? What, what is God's purpose and God's plan for them? They have to, lo to learn first that God loves them, that they can approach God through the, all the system that we have studied so far, the sacrifices, the priesthood that been uh, established. They are a different people. They are a chosen people. God says, I have set you apart from all of other nations to be my very own. So they had to live by a different rule. This is a good news. Don't you think so? Hello? Amen. This is a very good news. God wants them for his very own. So it is spiritually equivalent to us today of being saved and being sanctified. What's the difference? There's no difference. They were trained under a worldly system. God brought them, revealed himself to them, trained them to change, sanctified them, says, now you belong to me, you will live differently. What happened to, to us? In our past, we spent years of our life in the world, learning all sorts of things uh, from, from the world. We developed a worldly outlook, worldly goals, worldly attitudes. Then we came to the Lord and we were saved. And the Holy Spirit came into us and he changed us. But you know, when we became saved, at the moment of our salvation, we remained the same person as we had been before. We still had our traditions. We still had the influence of our uh, old culture. We still had the uh, uh, understanding. We still had, you know, our goals had not yet been transformed. Our mind had not yet been transformed. We just got saved. The potential of transformation came into us. The Holy Spirit came in. That's the difference. But the transformation came along the way. So we have become saved and sanctified. So our experience of salvation and their experience here is very much the same. Do you think so? Hello, I'm asking you a question. Yes, please. Thank you. The difference is the Holy Spirit that moved inside. I don't know if you are like me, but I remember so much the joy and the excitement when I began to discover God, God's word, God's will, the power of prayer, the, the joy of fellowship. Uh, I remember these moments when we started to meet, that's our first contact with the church, our first contact with the group around kitchen table of, of a brother's or sister's home, and opening the Bible together. It was, everything was wonderful. E everything we read, everything we heard was just a discovery of God. Do you remember this time? I hope you have had this experience in your life. Then we read and repeated, and we discussed that the last time, the expression, for I am the Lord your God. It comes 50 times in this book of Leviticus. 50 times where God says, I am, because I am the Lord your God, here is the rules that I am giving you. Because I am the Lord of God, you have to be different. Because I am the Lord your God, you belong to me now. Because I am the Lord your God, you will be separated. You belong to me. This is repeated over and over again. And this talks about, I am the Lord, your God. So there's a covenant. There is a coming together between God and I. We have accepted that. Last time I mentioned that those of you who have been baptized, you already agreed to this covenant. You agreed to the new covenant. You agreed that your sin were removed from you and that you were now living into the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have agreed to that. The baptism, water baptism, is, is an agreement, is a declaration of faith, is a declaration of discipleship, is the declaration, I am yours, I belong to you. Is that right? Okay, thank you for answering. Yes, you're getting better. Getting better and better. So the Lord says, because I am the Lord your God, do not live like you used to. You're different. 
You like me. That's what God is saying. You are like me. You are becoming like me because you belong to me now. You and I, you know that. I'm not announcing anything. You, we live in a world that does not reflect the God of the Bible. You, you, are you clear on that? Yes? Okay. Only on that side they are clear. This side they're still, they're still sleeping. So show me that you are not sleeping on that side. Last time, next time when I ask a question. Okay. The, this world, ref, the, the values of the world, the ways of the world, it reflects also the values of the God of this world. The Bible, New Testament, when it talks about the little g, the little g, God of this world, talks about Satan, the spirits of rebellion in this world that lure our, us based on our uh, lust, our greed, our passions, our evil desire. So we are still living in that system. Okay. So now I want to turn to a text of the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. I want you to discover something with me this morning. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Are you the temple of the living God? Yes. yes. Oh, that side stronger than that side. Yes. Okay, I need to hear you stronger next time. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Is, does that sound negative to you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughter. Does that text sound negative to you? Does that text <laughs> sound negative to you? No. no! Okay, now you are really stronger than that side. Next time I'm going on that side. Okay. I want you to now reflect upon this text. Do you see any resemblance between this text and Leviticus? Do you see any resemblance between what we have studied in Leviticus and this text? The answer is yes. Yes. yes, absolutely yes. We are talking about the temple. We are talking about separation. We are talking about becoming holy, about belonging to the Lord. We are talking about approaching the Lord, having communion with the Lord, living our lives based on His rules, not imitating the former ways of life. Where is this text from, the Old Testament or the New Testament? This is the New Testament. Where, where is my, my Second Corinthians 6? It's not there. Oh, I'm so sorry. Are you sure it's not there? It has to be there. Find me Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 to 18. I, okay, let me tell you uh, something that happened to me this morning. Last night, I sent this, uh, this PowerPoint to my dear brother, Jessing, so that they can translate it for the second service in Chinese. And I must have forgot this, this text that I'm talking about. <laughs> and this morning, when I came to church, just at the lift, oh, no, I forgot my, my USB. So I came here without that. So, yeah. Sarah will, will fix that. She, she knows like, uh, how to change the font, the font color and everything, and she will find that. Anyway, so what, now I'm, I'm all confusing you and I'm confusing myself. Okay, I wanted to show you 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 to 18, because this is a New Testament text. You, do you know how to change the color of fonts? You click on the little box. Okay, yes. Okay, now you have to add to that to verse 18. All right? And that's the text that we want to look at this morning, right now. 
And I want you to realize that this text is in the New Testament. It is given by Paul to the church of Corinthians, to us. And it reflects exactly what we are reading from the book of Leviticus. It's exactly, exactly the same thing. What is common between the temple of God and the idols of the former way or other cultures? We are the temple of the living God. God says, I will. Look at all the I will. That is the intention of God that is described there. And this is exactly what God, we have read in Leviticus so far. This is the intention of God. I want you. I want to be your God. And look at the end of that. More than to be your God, because God insists on the type of person, the type of relationship, the quality, the intensity. He says, I want to be more than your God, if you don't understand that a God is far away from you or something. I want to be your father. So that means I want to be close to you. I want to show you protection. I want to show you my presence. I want to behave with you just like a perfect father, not a bad father, because some of us have had bad fathers, like the perfect, loving, caring, patient, merciful, uh, perfect father would do. So that is what God is saying. Is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. So now, when we continue, we also see some conditions to that. What are the conditions in verse 17? Come out. Be separate. Touch new unclean things. And I will receive you. Okay. So what does mean come out from them? It means walk away. So that means you also have a role into that relationship with God. There's something in you that must make a decision. I am choosing to walk away. I, uh, like, like when you are baptized and you come out, you are saying, I want to live in this newness of life. I choose, it's my choice, this is my future, I'm not going to live like before. I escape that. That's what the, the Hebrew word and the Greek word says. Escape, walk away. Be separate here. It talks about the, the Hebrew word, the Greek word talks about boundaries. Setting boundaries, marking your limits. This is very important if you are not married, if you are dating, if you are in courtship. You need to set boundaries and limits that are godly, that are according to God's nature and according to the holiness of God. If you are married, you need to set your boundaries. You need to set your limit on how you are going to behave toward other people of the uh, other gender. When you go to work, when you meet other people, when you, when you relate to people, you are not to imitate the other nations. You are not to live like the, in the Egyptians. You are not to carry the same values. You have to be separate to set your boundaries. Have you set boundaries in your life? If you have not set boundaries, when the temptation will come, you will fall. Because when the temptation appeals to your flesh, and you are already engaged, your emotions, your carnal nature is already... Ah, like uh, you, you think about it and you are kind of becoming obsessed about it. When the temptation will come, when the moment will come, it will be at the point of weakness and you will fall into sin. And then you will see something like the world says, it, it just happened. It just happened. Is that weird a little bit? Oh, I just slept with her, but I didn't really thought about it before. It happened. It happened. Because there was no boundaries. There was no limit. If there would have been boundaries set clearly in your heart and your desire for God, there would be no it just happened. It wouldn't have happened. Is that right? right. I agree? Yes. All right. So my point here is very simple. For those of you who are not yet convinced that the message of the Old Testament is only old and past, and does not relate to the New Testament, I have a news for you. Look at this text. This is Leviticus in the New Testament. Exactly, word for word, same theme, same truth, same message. 
Same thing. Do you agree now? Yes. yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. And then it says, I will, does it say, I will receive you? Yes, I will receive you. This is really good, this part. It means to take you and to my favor. Is that that nice? Encouraging? God says, if you escape, walk away, set your boundary, mark your limit, and oh, I forgot, touch no unclean thing. That's very important. Touch no unclean thing means it, it's not only not touching. And maybe there's the difference between the Pharisees. You know, the Pharisees interpreted the Old Testament a lot with the, the law. Don't touch means don't touch. Physical touch. But here it's not touch, physical touch. It's do not attach yourself. Don't attach your emotions. Don't attach your interest. Don't attach your, your heart. And that Don't go in that direction. Don't attach. Don't get attached to that. You understand there's a difference between touching and getting your heart involved in attaching. So that's what it says. And if you do that, if you, if you choose, you, first of all, you, you are so wise. You, you agree with me this morning. You are so wise if you choose to live like that. You see, last week, Pastor Jennifer was talking about boundaries. And I really enjoy what she's talking about when God sets boundaries. When God says, don't, it's not to make our life miserable. Yesterday, or the day before yesterday, I listened to a sermon. I began listening to a sermon from a Bible teacher that I like. And it was on Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage against the Lord and his anointed? And he was explaining at some point there that for the world and the world's viewpoint, they think that you and me, Christians, because we believe in God and we accept, we accept to walk away from certain things, we accept to set boundaries, we accept the boundaries of God, and we accept not to attach ourselves to unclean or things that will defile us. They think that we, that the Lord, believing in the Lord, brings uh, bondage to us. It's like the Lord is bringing bondage to you. If you choose the Lord, oh no, no, I want my freedom. Is that, that right? People think like this. People think if, if you talk about God, they will say, no, 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 I want my freedom. Is that right? So what they are saying, they are saying, believing in God only brings freedom. Cannot, cannot, cannot. Oh no, I want my freedom. It brings bondage. But what we read here is not at all like that. And what Pastor Jennifer shared last week, the boundaries of God, they are wise. They are good. It comes back to the definitions of God is holy. And the def the un our understanding of the word holiness must change. Holiness means perfection. Holiness means absence of evil, wickedness, uh, uh, defilement, uh, impurities. It means something perfect. It's heaven. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's glory. It, it's, this, is, this is what we all should be aiming at and rejoicing when it talks about the word holy. But for many people, when we are, actually I heard something also this week. Uh, it comes from a worship leader, and uh, he was explaining that when he sings songs uh, to a congregation like us, on songs with the themes of holiness, that he has observed that many Christians, they stop worshiping or lifting their hands, and, you know, and, and their face show, how should I respond to that? It's like this is a, some kind of a confusion and a, 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 a feeling of being uncomfortable. What, what, how am I going to respond to holiness? We don't understand the beauty of holiness and the desire of God to bring us into being free from anything that is unclean, defiling, anything that would separate us from him in this life right now. And in the life to come. Because there's a life to come, also eternal life. Amen? Amen. 
Hallelujah. So do you agree that this text resemble Leviticus? Yes. Hello? Yes. yes. What about this side? Yes. yes. Yo, not so much. Not so much. <laughs> you lack a little bit. Okay. Let's move on. We'll go back to Leviticus. Sorry, Sarah, that I put you into this uh, situation. We're continuing in chapter 18 of Leviticus. Now we're going to something, and then you will say, is that necessary to talk about it at church? None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Again. So, none of you, does it say none of you? Does that exclude anybody of you? Hello, hello, hello. None of you, does that exclude you? No. That includes everybody. None of you should approach. You know that, you see, this is, this is weird. We all know that. We wouldn't do that. I'm a pastor for, since 1981. That's a long time now, I think. And the first time that I was exposed to something. I was with an evangelist and I was translating. He was coming from English speaking Canada and we had a weekend for young people. And I was the translator. And when he did the altar call, he says, please everybody, they were all teenagers, young adults, university, something. Close your eyes, bow your head. I'm not saying it now, but that's what the, the altar call then. And uh, because I don't want anybody to see anybody else. Now it's you and God and you and me. You only see me. You don't see the neighbors beside. Then he said something very strange and I almost panicked. Because I was the youth director. I said, where is he going with that? He says, if any of you have been molested, sexually abused, and that has brought shame, and that has destroyed a lot of your life, and you have been hurt by that. Look at me, if you can. And I was so shocked. We were a Pentecostal church, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and everything, exercising the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and there, we had about 500 young people. One head, another head, another head, tears coming out. It happened. I never, I never thought of even addressing this point on that, on that point in my, in my ministry. I, I never had this experience. And for the first time, I realized this is happening. Actually, later I found out that in my youth group, in my own little countryside town, I had a young lady, her dad was doing it to her. I went to another retreat in the north of the province and I was speaking there. And at, at that time, I'm the one who did the altar call and asked. And the a young lady just sh start shouting and crying and went out the, the door. She was molested by her grandfather, who was a deacon in the church. And the pastor who had invited me to this meeting says, you don't know in which kind of trouble you have put me in now. I need to deal with that situation. Until that time, I didn't think these things will happen in the church of God, where people, you know, speak in tongues you know, and everything. And I'm sure that even in a crowd like this today, if I would, uh, you know, uh, do the same thing, there would be some of you, maybe you, uh, you have been hurt in exactly the same point. So when God says a text in Leviticus, he means what he says. If God says none of you sh should approach, it's because it's happening. It's because in, in the world and other societies, okay, it has happened, but in, among you, None of you should, it should not ever be heard of. You read that again, Old Testament, New Testament, it's the same thing, go in Ephesians. These things should not ever be heard among you, Ephesians chapter 5. 
none of these things, idolatry, sexual immorality, fornication, and the list goes on and on. There are many texts in the New Testament that says the same thing in the New Testament. But when God brings up a subject in the Bible, it's in the Old Testament, it's an obscure text, we don't go there, we don't read Leviticus, it's boring. And then you discover a text like that and say, why? Why, why should, should we talk about it or think about it? This phrase is used 17 times in this chapter to uncover the nakedness. 17 times. And then God is very clear. He, he applies it to who should not have their nakedness uh, exposed. And it's not about uncover about casual nudity, like it's just somebody's taking a, uh, a shower and then you just happen to, uh, by mistake, open the door and then you didn't know and then you see. That's not what we read over here. It includes the idea of inappropriate activity. Molesting, fondling. Actually, the approach means, in the original text, go near with the intent of. So there's already in the mind an intention of. That's what it means. None of you should go near a near relative and uncover the nakedness. It means it's already approaching with the intent. And notice that it talks about uh, near and kin uncle, cousin, father, mother, grandfather, step brother and sisters. It includes everything. 17 times next of kin. Why does God bring it up? Because it happens. Because it's a problem. Because the word that God used here, if it's, I'm not, it's um, the word, the word, I'm looking for the word, I've put it somewhere. It's a twisted, it's a wickedness, it's a twisted mind, the word used, that God used. Uncover means especially in a disgraceful manner. It's not uncover like a husband and his wife under the blessing of God. It's, it's in a disgraceful sense. And nakedness is mainly related to the nudity of a woman's part. And then the list, if you click, you will see everybody listed in the, in the click here. And we will not go into all the details, but you have the list is there. There is another expression that comes into this text. It is your brother's nakedness. And here there's a, pr a principle that is also repeated. Don't do this to your father. This is your father's nakedness. Don't do it to your mother. It's your mother's nakedness. Don't do it to your sister. Don't do it to your brother's wife. Don't do it to whatever, like, like this. It is their, uh, theirs. Here, the nakedness of an individual belongs to their spouse. That's what God is saying. It is protected. God instituted. It is not good for man to be alone. I will create a suitable helper to meet all the needs, emotional, companionship, physical need. And this nakedness belongs to that person under the blessing of God and the holiness and the sanctity of marriage. Do we understand that? Yes. Amen. So the nakedness of an individual belongs to their spouse and no one else. And it is a violation of God's law to give that nakedness to anyone else or for anyone else to take it by force or by uh, cheating or lying or whatever. There's a lot of things that in our society people may think it's okay, it's acceptable, but it's not okay with God. Leviticus 18, 19, 20. You shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she is in her menstrual uncleanness. 
and you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife and so make yourself unclean with her or to defile yourself with her. And verse 19, God is putting a fence around the wife to protect her from sexually abuse. There's a time in the month, leave her alone. In verse 20, we find the seventh commandment, Exodus 20:14. you shall not commit adultery with a definition. You shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife and so make yourself unclean with her or to defile yourself. There is no justification for adultery. Oh, my partner, my spouse doesn't understand me. Oh, we fell in love. Or oh, God let us and we just met and it is we are so blessed. There's nothing. And again, I want to give an advice here. Guard yourself against any form of infatuation. Infatuation is letting some emotions or attractions toward another person that should not start. It should not even be developed. It doesn't belong there. It should not. But infatuation is like it, it, you, let it, you let it happen, you let it begin, you let it uh, develop. Another thing also that comes in uh, human mind is imaginative fantasies. Fantasizing ab about somebody that you have seen, thinking about in a sexual way, and thinking of yourself at different, different role. You know the mind, the mind is complex. The mind is, is, can be perverse when it's not controlled by the Holy Spirit. So if you don't bring these imaginations, these fantasies, and these feeling of infatuation into the context of reality, I am married, I love my wife, I love my husband, I am a Christian, I follow God, I am different, if we don't bring it, and the consequences, if we just would think about the consequences of going further with that, we would stop. That's why I'm saying bring it into the reality. Think of the consequences of the damage that would be done. Proverbs 6, 32, 33. But a man who commits adultery is a fool. And that's why it says Think about the, the consequences. He brings about his own destructions. He will suffer disease and disgrace and never be free from the shame. Is that any clearer answer to that? If you bring your twisted fantasy into the reality, this is the reality. You're a fool. Come on back. You know, I remember someone who started a Christian with a Christian wife who started an affair a few years ago. And he was just happy. And he felt so cool uh, to have massage and to, you know, to, for that new freedom and that new feeling. And not having to carry the marital responsibility, paying the bills, the education, the discipline at home, and you know, the, the, the little boring things that everybody of us, washing clothes, buying food, paying bills, uh, you know, like the, the responsibility, and, and sometimes as Ben and wife, we disagree, we have to uh, make up, and we have to reconcile, and we have, you know, these kind of, of things that we go through. Oh, it's so much easier with this new girl. I don't have all of this pressure and these arguments at home and I feel so much free, she understand me, we never fight. Okay. You're a fool. Wait. She will ask you later the same thing that your wife is asking you right now. You will have to pay the same bills, you will have to wash the same clothes, you will have to buy the food, you will have to live, and maybe she will be ten times worse than your wife. You're a fool. You will never be free from shame. God is right. Amen? Amen? Amen. <laughs> that was good. 
and I'm stopping now. I have so many more things, like we're coming into the, uh, the hottest part in the next sections, but we, I, I, I'm not starting because it's time to stop. But God, God is right. God knows best. God says, because I am the Lord, you have to be different. And it's so much better to be different. Wow. Please say amen to that. Amen. It is so much better, the life, to be different, to live with God. Amen. Instead of being a fool, living in shame. God bless you. Amen. We'll continue next time.